My name is Ben, and I'll be walking you through a quick overview of a short history of big data. In this presentation, I'm going to start with the historical progression and then cover uh, data speed, like streaming data, and then a historical progression of the compute platforms. So what you're probably used to is working with, on your desktop, R or Python, um, and then you're usually reading data, making some transformations to it, and then writing those back to disk. If you're in a corporate environment, like a business or a research institution, maybe you have access to something fancier, like a relational database. So those came out in the 1980s for SQL and a bunch of commercial products to support the database. And basically the feature there is a bunch of tables where each table has a row with an entity uh, and each entity has some properties which would be the columns. So as a quick example of what that looks like, maybe we have some customer data with order IDs, when, it, when an item was placed and which customer placed it, then some more information on the customer data here, and finally a little bit of uh, information about what was in the order. So with those three tables, what I wanted to ask is, how many items did Sue buy? So if you're with someone in a, in a partner class environment, then you can ask, um, talk to them. But here we're just going to go through the answer, which is we find Sue, and that's she has customer ID number five. And then we see in the order date that the customer number five placed two orders, 2411 and 5983. And so those order IDs correlate to a set of items. Um, specifically, there were four items. So that's a, the answer to the question of how many items did Sue buy in a relational database. So these are uh, pretty useful if we have well-structured data um, that fits on a single computer and the the reason it's uh, orderly is because we can guarantee certain features about that data specifically when we're making transformations um, how stable is that database that's called the acid criteria and be a little bit slow and a little bit sort of uh, fragile if you need to make changes to the system So the reason that we have, recent, in the last few years, in the last 10 years, moved away from this, um, for one, is technology, right? We're, we're, we're buying larger hard drives, but the bandwidth to get data off of that hard drive has not kept up with the capacity. And the consequence of that is that it would take longer to read the same, the, the full sort of data off the hard drive. So the picture here is a guy sipping a lake out of a straw, right? This is the, the standard story here. The other reason that we moved away from relational databases for some applications is that a single computer just wasn't big enough to fit all of our data in. So even if you had really big hard drives, that still wasn't sufficient. So Grace Hopper um, has this quote that Rather than making larger oxen, we should just have more of them. And so this is the idea of scale out, right? buy a bunch of computers rather than trying making a really big computer. So Google did this. Right? Google created what's called Big Table, and this is their approach to using many, many servers all in a data center and uh, spreading that data across those servers and then being able to run computations against it. So for the rest of us, Yahoo created a uh, program called Hadoop MapReduce. And this was a method of both storing data, that's the Hadoop distributed file system, and also the processing that goes with it. So Hadoop refers to Hadoop MapReduce is both of those things, the storage and the compute. 
So the reason that Hadoop MapReduce is very popular for big data problems is because we want to spread the data across many different servers on many different disks. The other advantage that gets us is that once it is spread across its multiple servers to increase the capacity, it means we can also do parallel access of the data. And that both speeds up the computation in addition to expanding how much storage we have. And the specific jargon for breaking up your data across multiple servers is called sharding. As far as the computation goes, uh, the map reduce paradigm is basically an idea that you do some computation on local data and then in the shuffle phase spread the data across the different servers to get it to the right location and then a reduction phase is sort of a, a follow-on process to get you your answer. So the challenge of MapReduce is that you have to fit your the, the thing that you want to do into that paradigm. Normally this is the point at which I would break out uh, an example and there there is a, a website that I found that has a, a pretty good example of using Python to do a MapReduce program, but it's somewhat involved. It involves uh, using a virtual machine to get a Hadoop file system up and running. So, so I'm going to skip that over today, but it is available if you wanted to take a look at it. As far as is this still in use? Is it um, you know active? The answer is yes. So the U.S. Census Bureau um, in 2020 is going to conduct a nationwide sort of data gathering experiment of measuring where the United States is as far as population and they're going to be using uh, Hadoop MapReduce to support that that processing of the data. That's a pretty big data set to work with um, and, it, and it justifies the sort of infrastructure investment but most problems don't. If you're operating on uh, data that fits on a single hard drive, there's not a huge advantage to using MapReduce because MapReduce uh, introduces a bunch of overhead into doing the computation and storage and management. The other sort of spot where MapReduce isn't a good use is when you have interactive analysis. If you're doing something overnight and you just want to like do batch processing, MapReduce is great. It's not really responsive. And so if you're sitting there waiting for it to complete, you're going to be sort of impatient. In response to this, um, there was a, uh, an, a new technology called Spark, um, which was rather than using all, all of the disk for this capacity, uh, we do the computations in RAM. So the memory operations are much faster because you're not writing to disk and reading from disk every time. There's some flexibility in how you access Spark. Uh, so Spark is the sort of storage and uh, access paradigm through which you store the data and run it, but it's a bit more flexible than MapReduce and for most problems faster. Again, you can use uh, Spark in a Jupyter Notebook, which is um, fun to do, but I don't know Java, I'm not super strong with that, and I haven't used Spark myself. so. I'm going to reference that you can do it, but not skip to an example at this point. The important takeaway for me is to know when to use which platform. So if I'm confronted with a small data set, I'm just going to use the Python pandas that I'm used to or, or, or R if you're used to that. But when you start moving into the, the mul you know, needing multiple computers to do your data analysis, it's good to know when to use Spark versus MapReduce. So the, the takeaway there is that Spark is good for relatively large data set um, with interactivity, whereas MapReduce is for even larger data sets and not interactive. So that's not to say that the relational databases have gone away. It's just a trade-off of when do you use which methodology. So this is called the CAP the consistency and availability, availability and partition tolerance theorem, where you have to figure out what is it that you're really after, right? Do you want to be able to spread things across multiple disks? That's the partition tolerance, right? And if you want availability consistency, then you're going for a relational database. So 
what it is that you're after is a trade-off and you have to know what it is that you're trading off when you move to a different platform. So to summarize what we've covered so far, we've seen that CSVs, Exxon, uh, XML, JSON, those are formats for a single user on a single computer with a relatively small data set. And then uh, for well-structured data, maybe in a, a larger environment where you have a database administrator, maybe you'll run a relational database. And then if, as you grow, you grow to Spark and maybe even Hadoop MapReduce for really large jobs. So that wraps up our coverage of the data paradigms. The next thing I wanted to talk about is streaming data. So this is a, a departure, again, from the standard sort of use of thinking of data as like a, a fixed amount of information. And then when we get new information, we just append it on or create some new data. That's, that's the, the way that you'd have to rerun that query or transformation. But in contrast, there's another approach called streaming in which the processing is always going on and you never assume that there's gonna be some endpoint. You're just waiting for new data, new data to show up. So earlier in the semester, we did cover this a little bit at the very introduction. Um, we talked about Windows PowerShell and if you're on Mac or Linux, the terminal. Both of these support what's called command line pipes. And this, this is a streaming architecture for a single computer. I'm gonna, at this point, break out to a, uh, an example in Python, and we'll come back to that in a separate video. Um, and, and for now, we'll continue on, but this is gonna be linked uh, to another video about showing the streaming data processing. The, in the video that I just linked to, there was a, an example with streaming data, but sort of on a single computer. For larger systems where you have often many distinct data sources supplying data and also lots of consumers of that data, there's a sort of management middleware that you might want to introduce. And so there's a couple of projects like Flink and Kafka that uh, are intended to support that complexity. And the last thing I wanted to touch on quickly is the uh, progression of compute paradigms. So we've previously covered data, now we're going to cover compute. The reason this really fits into data science is because what we typically see in data science is like, here's some data, this is what I did to get this answer, right? That's like a, a story that you tell someone. But what you typically skip over is an explanation of what specific software was used. Was it Python, right? And if it was Python, was it Python 2 or Python 3, right? And these distinctions matter occasionally when you're trying to actually reproduce the work. And, and even if you say Python 3, you might not say, well, this is the, 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 the modules I was using, or this is the way to implement it, right? Because usually you're focused on the results. But there are cases where you saw some interesting result and you say, oh, I, I would like to do that myself, right? And this is a form of digital archaeology where you need to figure out how did they do that, right? <laughs> Which, if they're doing it now, it's relatively easy because you just go download the same software. But if you're trying to reproduce someone else's results from, say, 20 years ago, which is totally reasonable, right? Microsoft Windows 98, there are still instances of that running in the real world. Trying to figure out how they did that is really hard. Right? And so the justification here is that knowing how your compute infrastructure sort of is configured is important for reproducibility. And portability here, the argument is that if you're doing something in Windows, it should be as accomplishable in, in Linux or in, in a Mac software. So really when you tell someone this is the result I got, you want to be able to tell them all the steps that you did, including what were you using, right? Your, your computer is configured how, and what packages did you use, and what was the data format, right? These are all things that you want to convey. So what we're going to cover in the next few slides um, addresses those aspects.
All right, so back in the day, right, we started out with just what's called bare metal computers. It's just a standard desktop or server. Um, it has an operating system on it, and you are running an application that uses all that hardware. So the benefits here are that it's fast, and it's relatively simple to understand. There's a CPU, maybe a GPU with some disk and a monitor, right, things that you're very physically able to interact with. The problem is that if you're trying to maintain a system, um, typically you'd want to have multiple systems for redundancy in case one of them dies, right? which introduces some management overhead and the cost of managing multiple computers. So bare metal computing is, is fast, simple, but uh, complicated to manage and potentially expensive. As a reaction to exactly those cost factors, um, there was an, uh, the concept of a virtual machine introduced. So virtual machines have the same hardware requirements, but then add in uh, their own operating system on top of the existing operating system. And they'll either simulate the, the hardware or run through a hypervisor. And so there, there's a bunch of cost here in the performance, right? It's slower because you're simulating the CPU rather than directly accessing the CPU. Now, why would you do this? Right? The reason that you'd introduce virtualization is because you want to be able to migrate a running application to some other system. Right? And the way that you can do that is you can just move this virtual machine from one set of hardware to a different hardware, and you have some continuity there because of the virtualization. So there's a lot of positive features that come with virtual machines, but at the cost basically of um, another point where something can fail, some additional sort of resource util utilization because you're simulating hardware. Luckily, we are now in the world where we have a third option, containers. So containers have that same idea of sort of abstracting away the, the host operating system and allowing things to run within uh, containers, but without having the virtualization uh, that uh, a virtual server would, would have. So that, that hardware is not being simulated, it's less costly. So these containerized applications can either be running in their own operating system environment uh, hosted by the operating system running on the hardware, or they can actually run directly uh, in the container without a, an operating system and would use uh, the host operating system. So those containers can be run a couple different ways, whereas virtual machines, you're always simulating the hardware and they always have to have their own host operating system. So the difference um, between a virtual machine uh, and a container is that the virtual machine is slower. So the container basically runs at native speeds typically um, compared to a, a bare metal server where it has the, the fastest performance. So to make your life a little slightly more complicated, we're going to introduce uh, the last concept of function as a service. And this is rather than using uh, a virtual machine where there's a large overhead in simulating hardware or hosting your own container, you can just have a function that is waiting for you to call it. So this is, in, if you can think of like a Python application, a, a function that can be executed uh, just in the background without having to spin up an entire container or virtual machine or server to run that application. So it's just a, a function that sits there waiting to be called. So that summarizes what I wanted to cover today with uh, data paradigms. So we covered the idea of moving from a CSV into a relational database. And then if your size sort of calls for it, you can move to Spark or MapReduce. We also spend a little bit of time talking about streaming data versus batch processing. So streaming is where we have an unending amount of data coming into us and we're going to process it, whereas batch is the concept that we're going to take a chunk of data, operate on it, 
and then wait for the next one to show up. And lastly, we, co lastly, we covered four different concepts of uh, a bare metal server, where it's just the actual hardware and operating system. Then we talked about a virtual machine, where we're simulating the hardware on top of an existing physical server. And then a container, which is a little bit more lightweight because it doesn't simulate the hardware. And lastly, the concept of a function as a service, where we don't have all this administrative overhead, we're just doing one simple thing.